The wind was razor sharp against my face, a constant reminder of just how unforgiving Alaska could be. I'd spent the last decade up here in the wilderness, but this wasn't just another hunting or fishing trip. No, this was something different. I was on my way to meet Henry Kessler, an old trapper who, for years, had claimed to know the real truth about the disappearances in the remote stretches of Alaska, and not just Alaska. He said he knew what was happening all across the United States. Kessler was a grizzled legend in these parts, known for his hunting skills and survival instincts, and he had a reputation for being more than a little paranoid. But the stories he'd shared with people, they had a way of sticking with you. My name's Tom Larson, and I'd been investigating cryptids and strange occurrences for most of my life. It was a hobby I'd picked up after losing a friend to an accidental disappearance during a camping trip years ago. After that, the stories of people vanishing into thin air, of shadowy creatures lurking in the trees, had become personal. And when I heard that Kessler was finally willing to talk, I packed my gear and set off for the remote cabin where he'd lived alone for years. I arrived at Kessler's place just as the sun was dipping below the mountains, casting the whole landscape in a bruised, purple hue. Kessler's cabin was rugged, with patches on the roof and hand-cut logs reinforcing the walls. It looked like it had been standing for centuries, and maybe it had been, considering how isolated it was. Kessler himself was waiting for me on the porch, sitting in a weathered old rocker, a shotgun laid across his lap. His hair was white and thin, and his face looked like it had seen more than any one person should. He nodded at me as I approached. Tom, he grumbled in a voice like gravel. You're here to hear the truth, but once you hear it, there's no going back. I gave him a solemn nod. That's why I'm here, Henry. He stood up, motioned for me to follow him inside. The interior of his cabin was simple. Firewood stacked in one corner, jars of preserved food lining the shelves, and a wood stove that crackled with a comforting heat. But it was the walls that caught my attention. They were covered in maps, newspaper clippings, and photos, some yellowed with age. The missing persons flyers were the most unsettling, faces of people who had simply vanished, some with dates and red circles drawn around specific locations. Kessler noticed me looking. People don't go missing for no reason, he said, voice low. And it's not just Alaska, Tom. It's the whole damn country. People disappear, and no one bothers to connect the dots. I took a seat, trying to ignore the chill crawling up my spine. What do you mean? He handed me an old map, and I noticed red excess scattered across various points in the U.S. Remote parks, stretches of mountains, dense forests. Each X had a name and a date scrawled beside it. These aren't just random disappearances, Kessler said. The government knows about them. They know what's out there. They just don't want folks like you and me finding out. I studied the map, recognizing some of the names and dates. So what's causing this? What's out there, Henry? Kessler leaned forward, his eyes darkening. They're creatures, Tom. Some call them cryptids, some call them demons. Doesn't much matter what you call them. They're not from here, and they sure as hell don't play by our rules. He began to tell me about his own encounters, starting with the creature that haunted his land. He called it the Grey One. It was an enormous, wolf-like creature that moved on two legs and had eyes that glowed an unnatural yellow. He'd seen it only twice in his life, once when he first moved to this land, and again just a month ago. It's fast, smarter than anything I've ever seen, and it likes to stalk. Likes to let you know it's there before it disappears. Sometimes I think it just enjoys the fear, he said, his voice trembling just a bit. And it's not just the gray one, he continued. I've heard from trappers up north, folks who've been here long enough to understand that the land keeps secrets. They've seen things out there in the woods. Massive creatures covered in fur, humanoid but wrong. And down south, near the swamps, there's creatures that look like reptiles, but they walk like men. People go into those woods and never come back. I could feel my heart pounding as he talked, but he hadn't even gotten to the worst of it. 
About 10 years ago, I saw something near Denali, Kessler said, his face going pale. It was like a person, but it was, stretched out thin. No face, just skin pulled tight over bone. It didn't walk, it glided, and when it saw me it smiled. Not with a mouth. Its whole damn body seemed to twist into this, grin. I ran, but I could feel it watching me the whole way back to the cabin. I tried to process what he was saying, but it sounded impossible, like something out of a nightmare. Have you told anyone else about this? I asked. He gave a short, bitter laugh. Who'd believe me? The government knows, Tom. Hell, they know more than you'd think. I've seen helicopters hovering over certain areas at night, watched as men in hazmat suits went into caves and came out looking like they'd seen hell itself. But they don't report it. They tell the media it's training exercises or weather studies. Bullshit. Kessler stood up and went to a cupboard, pulling out a stack of files, all bound together with a frayed leather strap. He handed them to me. These are the records I've kept, he said. Sightings, dates, patterns I've noticed. It's all there. I took the files, feeling their weight in my hands. And what about the disappearances? Why would they hide this from people? Kessler's face grew darker. You see, Tom, these creatures, they're not just random predators. They're after something. Some believe it's souls, some think it's power. Others think they're just hungry. But the government? They'd rather keep it quiet. Imagine the panic if people knew there were things out here that defy everything we know. I spent hours listening to Kessler that night, his stories growing darker, the shadows in the room lengthening as the fire dwindled. He told me about the Wendigo in Montana, the Mothman sightings in the Midwest, strange lights over the forests in Oregon, and creatures in the Louisiana swamps that could mimic human voices. By the time he finished, the first light of dawn was peeking over the mountains. As I left, Kessler grabbed my shoulder. Be careful, Tom. Once you know about them, they know about you. Those words haunted me as I made my way back to civilization. I pored over Kessler's files for months, comparing them to other reports, cross-referencing with missing person records. The connections were there, hiding in plain sight. But the most disturbing part was that I started noticing things. A pair of eyes in the woods where there should have been none, shadows that moved when I wasn't looking, strange sounds in the night. Then, one evening, I found a note slipped under my door. In shaky handwriting, it simply read, you know too much. I haven't heard from Kessler since that night. I tried visiting his cabin, but it was empty, abandoned. No one in town knew where he'd gone. But I'll keep looking, because now I know the truth. The creatures are real, they're watching us, and anyone who learns too much is bound to disappear. The only question is, when will it be my turn? My boyfriend and I were camping in the woods last summer. It was about midnight, and we were still round the campfire talking and drinking. Earlier that day, we had seen a car with people drive past our camp, so we knew there were others in the close vicinity. Out of nowhere, we suddenly heard this gut-wrenching groaning coupled with crying and screams. A man sobbing got louder and would fade away until we heard crying again, thumping on the ground and all kinds of weird noises. I have never heard anything like it, and this went on for about five minutes. I was naturally shitting myself and because we're wild camping, the campsite's owners were about one kilometer in a farmhouse. We grabbed a knife and pretty much ran to the car and locked the doors. We texted the owners from the car and they came up to the site. Turns out the group that had driven past us come up every year for a spiritual healing retreat. The guy we heard screaming and crying was getting cleansed. I figured I would submit my weird experience that I had several years ago. My wife, kids, and I were living in government housing and had just moved into a larger apartment across the road from where we were living. We upgraded from a two to three bedroom apartment. 
I would like to note that the housing where I am from is actually really nicely kept up and is more of an older folks community rather than a slum that housing is notorious for. We loved living there. This was in Chaffee, Missouri, which is in southeast Missouri in northern Scott County. We moved in the week of Christmas 2020 or 2021. I can't remember exactly because those years get me confused because we had so much going on and we only lived there about 18 months before getting a house. So one night the kids were asleep and me and the wife were in bed. She was asleep and I was playing on my phone. The bed was situated so that I could see into the hall from the bed. The end of the bed was across from the door. Note this was around 1.30 a.m. As I played on my phone, I started to see a bright glowing light coming from down the hall. I told my wife I was going to check it out as I thought maybe it was my computer that was in the living room. I got up, went down the hall, looked around, and didn't notice anything out of the ordinary. I went to the bathroom and then got back in bed. In total, this took maybe two minutes. The apartment was small, and you could see everything in just a minute or so. When I got back in bed, I got back on my phone, and that's when I noticed the time. It was 2.15 a.m. I had been gone for 45 minutes. My wife was fast asleep and snoring. I woke her up and asked her how long I had been gone. She didn't know and was still half asleep. Looking back at this situation, I still cannot explain how I was gone for such a long time without. As I remember the event clearly, and there were no gaps from the time I got up, looked around, went to the bathroom, and got back in bed. This incident occurred along the Wise River in Montana. The actual address is 6172 Montana Highway 43, Wise River, Montana 59762. I lived alone and in this remote location. We don't have cable so the only option is satellite TV. It was a humid summer night in July 2015 at around 11.30 p.m. and the TV was acting up so I needed to go out and readjust the satellite like usual. I took a flashlight and a gun with me. When I went outside it was unusually quiet. I also purchased an R due to other sightings I've had, but they weren't credible enough to chalk it up as a dogman. It was so silent it was unnerving. I brushed the thought off and went to the dish which is in the corner of my yard. I went to work, making sure all the wires were alright and pointing it to a different angle. Suddenly I heard a small snap of a stick to my left and turned the flashlight in the direction, and I saw a creature standing there. I got a good look at it for what seemed like an eternity, but was for only about 10 seconds. I slowly backed off and ran back to the house and locked all the doors and windows. The creature was unlike anything I had ever seen before. When I shone the light on it, the first thing I saw was the head. It has cropped ears that point upwards. Its snout was narrower than a bear's and longer, and I could make out large teeth protruding from the jaw. Its eyes were a deep red shade that seemed to reflect off the light I was pointing at it. The body was muscular and huge. It had long arms that appeared to be longer than its legs. Broad shoulders that tapered into a skinnier waist. It was slightly crouched over when I saw it, with one hand wrapped around a small tree. I could make out the legs which looked similar to a dog's legs. They had obvious hocks. Even with the crouch position, it was about my height, which is six feet. Standing up to full height, this creature could easily be 7.5 feet tall. The fur was black and thicker around the neck and chest, and the bottom half significantly less so. I don't know if it was aggressive or not. What I know is I had a feeling of dread, unlike anything I've ever experienced. Was it just observing me or stalking me? For a creature, this large it was deceivingly silent. It got within 15 yards of me without me noticing. All I knew was I needed to get out of there and not find out. I don't live on the property anymore, but after the event, I never had another face-to-face -face encounter. But I would hear sounds in the woods I couldn't explain. They would start off relatively quiet and work their way up to furious howls or screams, then back down to quiet again. I don't know if this was the same thing because it could be local wildlife.
Back in the day when I was younger, man, I was driving a truck down in Georgia and I picked up a load of mulch. I'm going down this two lane road and I don't remember the exact area. I remember looking at my atlas as I was driving. It was above Jacksonville, Florida, but on the Georgia side, and there was some kind of a national park there, with an Indian name Okfinoki National Wildlife Refuge. But as I was driving, I saw what looked like, what I thought was, a bear or something getting ready to cross the road. I'd never seen anything like that because I'm from Ohio. I'd been staring at the ditch line because I was looking at, like, a planted forest. I'd never seen, you know, planted forest before. It was all pine trees symmetrically lined up and everything. So I see this bear start to come out across the ditch and cross the road. So I started covering my brake. I'm like, oh my god, I'm gonna hit a bear. And it turned and looked at me. Its face was flat and it didn't have the big nose like, like a bear does and I'm like, whoa, what the heck is that? It didn't look big and heavy like everybody describes it. It hunched over just like a Bigfoot but it looked smaller like it had really long hair but not as bulky. The thing that ties into this dimensional thing for me is that I had this thought before I ever heard anybody talking about it. It looked at me in the truck, and then it turned its head and like a streak of lightning, it went back into the woods from where it came. All the trunks on the trees, they didn't really have branches on the low levels, and so I'm looking at it, trying to look at it running through the woods, you know, to make sure I've seen what I saw and it just vanished. It just vanished. These trees weren't full grown. They were maybe six to eight inches in trunk diameter and everything was in a perfect line. There's absolutely no way it could have hidden behind a tree. It just turns like a streak of lightning. I saw it running about 10 feet and then it just vanished. So I'm pulling over on the side, rubbing my eyes like I've been on the road too long. But then all these years later, I keep hearing everybody talking about the dimensional thing and that it's perfect with, you know, never finding the body and all that kind of stuff. I love the outdoors and I'm kind of a loner, so I have several stories from times I was out adventuring alone. Lots of encounters with animals, but the most disturbing were run-ins with other people in places they shouldn't have been. One stands out as particularly alarming to me. I was driving up in the mountains in western Colorado, on a road that led to a now deserted ghost town that was a bustling mining town in the late 1800s. On my map, the road ended at the ghost town, and I planned to hike a few miles into the woods and camp and hike around for a few days up there. High altitude, rapidly changing weather conditions, and no cell service. This was 2005. Driving up the steep road, my car began to overheat. I reached the town site as the engine temperature reached the critical point. I turned off the engine, popped the hood, and determined that, while the car was not totally disabled, it would have to cool down for several hours before I could drive anywhere. My new plan was to let it cool down completely and hope that I could drive back to the nearest town that night without overheating again. It was all downhill so I could probably roll for most of it, if need be. I spent the next few hours walking around the town site, which was mostly just a grassy field. There were the remains of a few log cabins and stone foundations, a few mine entrances or piles of tailings, and what was left of the town graveyard, but not much else. As the sun dropped below the horizon and night began to fall, I heard a car driving up the road. It pulled up next to my broken car, stopped, and shut off. I started walking toward it to see why another person would be driving up a dead-end road at nightfall, and perhaps ask if they had any tools or coolant I could bum from them. A guy got out of the car, a beat-up white Honda Civic. How he got it up that washboard mountain road, I'll never know. He was a few years older than me, grizzled looking with an unkempt beard, wearing tattered jeans and a dirty flannel shirt. He asked if I needed help, and I explained my situation. He was reserved, but not unfriendly, and told me that he was a miner from a small and probably illegal or unlicensed mine, who had been injured on the job and without health insurance had found himself homeless and living out of his car. He said he knew these woods and the ground beneath them like the back of his hand, 
and moved around from place to place setting up camp or sleeping in his car where he wouldn't be bothered. He said he knew of an abandoned mine site with an old, but intact, cabin about a mile from where we had parked, and he was heading there to squat for a few days before he moved on. He asked if I wanted to check it out with him, and I agreed. I got my pack from my car, which contained, along with the usual camping stuff, my 44 Magnum revolver. I usually keep it loaded when on adventures like this, but only have the six rounds in the cylinder with no spare ammo. I carry it for defense from animals, mostly, and holster it on my belt. When the guy saw it, his eyes went wide and he asked what I intended to do with the gun, and I explained it was just for self-defense from animals, nothing more. That seemed to satisfy him, and we explored the area around the car a bit. I stopped back at the car a few times to grab things I had forgotten, including a six-pack of beer, and one of those times I decided to take my revolver off of my belt and put it in my pack. I knew I felt something off and was on my guard the entire time around him. I even made a note describing him and recording his license plate number in a notebook in my pack in case I disappeared and someone needed to know what happened. These are the kinds of precautions I take when I want to undertake risky adventures. We hiked the short distance to the mine site, which was one old cabin, a dilapidated steel derrick above a vertical mine shaft, and a bunch of junk strewn about. After stashing my pack in the cabin, we walked over to the mine site. We climbed up on the derrick and sat on a small platform, and I shared my beers with him. He said this vertical mine shaft was about 700 feet deep, which he knew because the mine he had worked in had horizontal shafts that intersected this one, and we dropped our empty beer bottles down the shaft, listening for them to smash at the bottom, but they just disappeared into the blackness. We had some other bum fun, like rolling old tires down the pile of mine tailings, before going back to the cabin to set up for the night. The inside of the cabin was full of trash, but there was a cast iron stove in decent shape, and we lit a fire for warmth. He shared his food with me, a tin of kippered herring and some crackers, and we set up beds on opposite sides of the small cabin. As we lay down to go to sleep, he asked me out of nowhere if I had brought my gun along. I felt a flash of uneasiness and told him that no, I had decided to leave the gun in the car when I went back to get the beer. In reality, I had most certainly brought it along and had placed it under my pillow. We talked no more and I fell asleep. I woke up in the middle of the night and, although it was nearly pitch black in the cabin, I could see that he was sitting up in his bed. I couldn't make out his face, or even where he was looking, but I lay still and watched him for what felt like an hour. He never moved, and I eventually fell back asleep. We were awoken in the morning by someone knocking on the cabin door. He and I both looked at each other, wide-eyed, sure we were about to be confronted by whoever had title to the old cabin. After waiting for several minutes, we crept to the windows of the cabin and looked out. No one was there a bird of some kind had been pecking on the cabin walls, which sounded exactly like knocking. We packed up and went outside, and he asked me to help him look around the woods for some stuff he had hidden a while back and wanted to retrieve. I helped for a little while, but we didn't find it and I was restless to try to get my car back down to the nearest town and start figuring out how to get home. We parted ways and I hiked out of the woods to my car which started right up and I headed down the mountain. I got home late that night and started putting away my gear. I got to my revolver and out of habit, opened the cylinder to unload it now that I was home. It was empty. I thought and thought about everything I had done since the last time I had checked the gun. I know it was loaded when I put it under my pillow. I never unloaded it or even removed it from my pack between the cabin and my house. I went through everything in my pack every pocket and gear bag. I went outside and looked through my entire car. There was not a round to be found. In the middle of the night, while I slept, the homeless man had found my revolver under my pillow, unloaded it, and returned it to where I had put it without waking me. He had a loaded gun inches from my head, and I never even knew it. I have no idea what his intentions were. I like to think he was acting out of self-preservation unsure if he could trust me not to murder him in the night. 
But then again, he could have unloaded it so it would be useless if I needed it to defend myself from him. That was the closest I've ever come to being murdered in my sleep, and one of the scariest realizations of my life. I've since been much more careful to conceal my gun at all times. Epilogue. I actually ran into the homeless man again, years later, again in the woods, but about a hundred miles away from the cabin we had shared. He recognized me, and I recognized him, but he acted very cagey and standoffish, so we talked for a few minutes and I continued on my way. He's probably still up there, if he hasn't died or been killed by the mountains. They can be very unforgiving. I was visiting rural Quebec St. Edgar, New Richmond over the holidays in December 2017. My boyfriend's mom and grandmother lived there along with most of that side of his family, since his parents are long divorced. There was a lot of snow on the ground and more coming down every day and night. But on this night, there was very little snow coming down and it was easier to see at night. My boyfriend and I had taken his grandmother's car out to go drifting down a long road surrounded by forest. It's the same road everyone who is local to the area uses for racing. There's so little to do in this tiny town that people will actually get drunk and go racing down this winding road for fun, and friends and family will come to watch and cheer them on. There are a lot of car accidents in this area, and this area is also overflowing with wildlife. Deer, bear, moose, coyotes, wolves, rabbits, skunks, etc. It's a fantastic area for hunting when legal. So picture this. My boyfriend is driving us to his mother's house, and we've been drifting on purpose and laughing and obviously scared of what we were doing, but having a great time. We're almost to the end of the road, and because of the drifting, it's taken longer than usual to get home. Something swoops through the trees to our right, just above where the headlights are lighting up so we can't see all of it anymore. The thing is so large and heavy that the trees it touched are swaying all around. It had huge black wings that acted as a sort of blanket that covered and blacked out an already dark sky, and its shape was indistinguishable beyond that. The only thing I could think to describe its size was a moose with wings. Minus the four legs. Definitely not a moose. That's just to explain the size of the thing. My boyfriend almost swerved into the trees. He and I were really startled and panicked the whole rest of the drive home, and instead of drifting, we just drove straight home. He refuses to believe it was anything supernatural and decided it must have been the world's largest owl. I told him that if he ever finds an owl the size of a car, he should rest assured it is not an owl. I hadn't thought about this until a couple of days ago when I was listening to a compilation of stories about skinwalkers, and it got me thinking if what my boyfriend and I saw was some sort of cryptid. The closest resembling cryptid is a mix of a mothman or jersey devil. I have no idea. Hopefully this is useful to you. I was camping with a mate on my parents' farm down on a river. We could hear noises. We assumed that my sister and her friends had walked down to F with us. I looked out of the tent and saw what appeared to be someone watching us next to the fire. They realized I saw them and then ran off into the scrub. I said to my friend, let's leave them here. So we got out of the tent and jumped on the quad bike to go up to the house leaving them on the river without the satisfaction of scaring us. We left immediately. It's about two kilometers to the house. When we got there, my sister and her friends were watching a movie and hadn't moved at all, which was confirmed by everyone. They also couldn't have physically made it before us. To this day, I have no idea who or what I saw, and it horrifies me. This may end up being a long post, so sorry in advance. This is the first time I have shared what happened to a buddy and I a few years ago. We promised not to say anything, but I figured I could post it here without people thinking we were crazy. So a few years ago, I was 23 at the time, my best friend returned home from Afghanistan. 
He was or is a Marine and had been away for almost a year. We always talked about going hunting when he returned, and so when returned in late November we made plans to go to my hunting camp during the Christmas break. Since I was still in college and he was going to be starting school in the spring, we each had a little less than a month of freedom to do what we wanted. We decided to stay at my camp house for a solid week to hunt and drink beer. It was late December in the south so it was cold but not terrible, but it was overcast almost every day. One particularly cloudy day we decided to go hunting in the afternoon to see if we couldn't kill a white-tailed deer or a hog. We were hunting in two different areas so I dropped my friend off at his stand at 1 p.m. and drove the short distance to my stand. As a crow flies I was maybe 200-300 yards away from him when sitting in my stand. The afternoon passed by with no luck. I had not seen a single animal. Not even a bird. I thought this was odd, but honestly it was kind of bad weather so I wasn't that put off by it. I just figured all the creatures were hunkered down for the night. As the sun began to set I decided to leave the stand a little bit early so I could be there when my buddy decided to stop hunting for the evening. I made the trek back to my car, and as I was about to get in I heard a blood-curdling scream coming from the area where my buddy was hunting. I guess scream is not the best word to describe it. It was more of a war cry. If you have ever seen the movie Full Metal Jacket, and remember the part when the drill sergeant asks to hear Joker's battle cry, that was the noise I heard. Not knowing what was going on possibly my friend fell and hurt himself, or was just ready to go and trying to signal me I hopped in the car and cranked it. Then I heard the first shot, quickly followed by number two, three, four. I quit counting and began driving to my friend's position. I was driving like a bat out of hell, but could still hear my friend firing away with his rifle and continuing to yell through my open car window. About halfway to the stand I had to slam on the brakes to keep from hitting my friend. There he was standing in the middle of the road with his back to me. I could then see he had both of his pistols drawn and pointing at the woods about 30 yards in front of him. His rifle lay at his feet, empty. I grabbed my 1911 45, my flashlight, and exited the vehicle slowly. As I approached my friend I could see that he was shaking. But he never broke eye contact with the area of the woods where he was pointing his sidearms. Since he had just returned from Afghanistan, I approached him slowly thinking he may be having a flashback or something PTSD related. Granted I had never seen this from him since he returned, but he was a marine and I wasn't taking any chances. Once I got closer I asked calmly, Thomas, are you okay? No answer, he never even acknowledged I was there. Never broke eye contact with the woods. Again I asked, Thomas, what's up? Is everything all right? It's Bishop. What were you shooting at? This time I finally got a response, though not to the questions I was asking, Thomas replied, Do you see it? As he nodded to point with his head at the area of woods. At this point the sun had set, but there was still just enough sunlight to brighten the sky. It was then I finally decided to look at the place where he was aiming, and all I could see was shadows but one of the shadows seemed to be moving as they tend to do in the twilight, so I lifted my Stinger flashlight and pointed it towards the woods. I then saw what my friend had seen, and this still gives me chills when I think about it. But back in the woods maybe five yards off the road, but thirty-five yards or so from us was a set of red eyes. The eyes were maybe seven feet off the ground and right next to a tree. I kind of chuckled to myself at the time, Believing it to be a possum or a raccoon hanging on to the side of the tree, I told my friend. It's nothing, man. It's just a raccoon or something. Thomas quickly retorted, that ain't no raccoon. To prove him wrong, I took aim with my 45, right between the two red eyes and pulled the trigger. As soon as I fired, the eyes disappeared. But I didn't hear the thud of an animal dropping to the ground. Instead, all I heard was this thing scampering through the leaves towards us. The thing did not come directly towards us though, it was still maybe five yards deep in the woods, but had advanced much closer. I pointed my light towards the area where I heard it stop and again, there was the two red eyes about seven feet off the ground on another tree. 
Now I started to get creeped out because any normal animal would have hauled ass away. I tapped on my friend's shoulder and said, let's get the F out of here. He picked up his rifle, holstering one sidearm and back towards the truck. I did the same, not wanting to take my eyes off this thing. I finally reached my car after what seemed like an eternity and broke eye contact to get in. When I picked my head back up, the eyes were now on the side of the road just feet from where we were standing, but now they were hovering behind some foliage at a height of maybe four feet. I told my buddy not to lose sight of it and to keep his gun ready. He nodded in agreement. I put the car in reverse and began to back down the road when the most evil cackle rang out from the woods. At this point Thomas began to talk, dude, go faster, go faster, go faster damn it. I pushed the gas pedal as far down as it would go, and we were rocketing down this dirt road in reverse. When we reached the main road, I quickly whipped my truck around and slammed it into drive. It was in this split second between transitioning from reverse to drive that I glanced out my window down the dirt road we had just come from. I still cannot be certain of what I saw, but through the dirt and dust, through the darkness of twilight I could make out a figure moving towards us rapidly. It seemed to be made of darkness, it was very lanky like if you were to wrap black cloth around a skeleton. But it was not human, it was kind of hunched over at legs and running like a human doing a sneaky run. I broke eye contact and looked forward as we were now speeding off in that direction. I breathed a sigh of relief as we reached the main highway and began the drive back to the camp. Shortly thereafter we began discussing what the F had just happened. I asked, what the F was that thing? Thomas replied, I don't know what it is, but I know what the locals called it. I looked at my friend puzzled, you mean you have seen this thing before? The locals called it many things, but the most common was Gull. After talking for a while, he related the story behind his first encounter with this thing. But in the interest of keeping this story short, I will save that for next time. We have not shared this story because honestly who would believe it? All I can say is that this thing is real, and shooting at it seems to have no effect. If you have encountered something similar please feel free to share, and if you know how to kill it. I know one marine that would love to know how. Part 2 In the first post I mentioned that my friend had previous experience with this thing. Throughout his deployment, he and his squad had many encounters with it, some worse than others. But as all stories go, you have to understand the events that lead up to this point in time. Some details have to be left out of this story because it would potentially put my friend in danger. More on that aspect in a later post. My buddy was deployed to Afghanistan in late 27. He was stationed in the southeast region of the country in the mountains. I'm afraid to even mention the number of people in his outpost for fear of it being tracked back to him, but it was a decent size. Within a month or so of being there my friend became accustomed to firefights. It was a contested area and the insurgents would often fire at the base or attack the local villagers. After one brutal attack on the local village, my friend and his squad began patrolling this area to protect the civilians. It did not take long for the insurgents to notice this and one day they decided to ambush my buddy and his squad. For the sake of keeping this short, during the firefight the son of the village elder decided to walk out of his house and investigate with his AK-47 in his hands. Thinking he was one of the insurgents they shot him and killed him. Now I could go into further detail here, but I trust my friend when he said it was an accident. When the fight ended my friend had the responsibility of going with the translator to tell the elder what happened to his son. Needless to say the man was very upset and began yelling at my friend. The translator told him to walk away and that he would console the old man. A few minutes later the translator walks back to the squad and says time to leave. Figuring everything was going to be okay they began to walk away. In the background they could hear the old man half sobbing half yelling at them. They returned to base with no further confrontation and did what all marines like to do. They went to go get some grub. While they were eating my buddy noticed their translator had been oddly quiet the entire time and was not eating like the rest of them. Thomas approached the man and asked him what was wrong. 
The translator stared blankly at Thomas for an uncomfortable piece of time before finally saying, we're cursed. Thomas chuckled a bit because until this time he had no reason to fear such things. But he soon would. Upon further questioning, the translator told them that the village elder had put a curse on them, and until he lifted it, the gull would be after them. The squad thought nothing of it, screwed around playing cards for a while, and went to sleep. When Thomas awoke the next morning, he was exhausted. He hadn't slept much at all that night because he kept having strange nightmares and was just generally restless. Again, Thomas ignored this and began his regular routine until he noticed everyone had the same experience that night. None of his squad mates had slept well either and most like him, had nightmares all night. Even the translator had a tough evening, and it was the translator who suggested they go back to the village and ask the old man to lift the curse since he is the only one who could do so. Thomas and his boys went out on patrol as usual and decided to follow the translator's advice and head up to the village. Upon arriving, they found that everyone in the village had been killed during the night by the insurgents, including the old man. Fast forward a couple weeks, Thomas and his squad are out on patrol at night looking for insurgents who had been moving guns and supplies through the area. This was their first encounter with the thing. Thomas was just walking along when a guy in front of him begins firing into the brush and trees. Immediately, Thomas began firing at the area too and moved to a better position. There was no return fire. No muzzle flashes from the enemy like you would expect to see. Quickly, the ceasefire was ordered and Thomas went to talk to the soldier who had started firing in the first place. When asked what he was shooting at, the soldier uttered an all too familiar phrase, I don't know. Thomas began to yell a bit and said, What do you mean you don't know? You just fired off at an unidentified target. What the soldier said freaked Thomas out. No, sir, I saw something. I just don't know how to explain it. It wasn't human, but it was no animal I know of the instant the soldier said. No animal I know of Thomas caught a glimpse of something moving about 300 yards out. It was obscured by bushes, but Thomas could make out two red eyes looking back at him. Thomas then alerted the rest of the squad and took a shot at the red eyes. They went out but quickly reappeared behind more brush, except it was about 150 yards out. They then got the sniper to take a shot at it with his 50 cal. Again the eyes disappeared but then reappeared even closer. They then called for air support but no assets were in the area. Thomas decided to launch a grenade at the thing, and this is when it turned bad. Once the dust settled from the explosion of the grenade, Thomas could make out the figure directly in front of them, but within 100 yards and closing fast. The squad immediately began laying down fire and performing a bounding retreat. They had gone maybe 50 yards when they noticed someone was missing, and they also noticed the figure with the two red eyes was nowhere to be seen. They called in for support to look for the missing soldier and a helicopter was dispatched from a base nearby. They advanced back to where they had last seen the soldier and could find nothing. The helicopter even scanned the area for heat signatures, but could not find anything, not even a blood trail. The soldier had just vanished. Upon returning to base, the entire squad was debriefed and forced to sign a non-disclosure agreement and was told to repeat none of this to the rest of the soldiers in the outpost. The Marine was never found and was falsely classified as KIA. They had a few more encounters with this thing before their tour was over, but that is another story. Side note, after posting the first story, I told Thomas that I had posted it and wanted to post the rest of his story. He was uneasy at first, but eventually relented as long as I would promise not to pass along any details that could identify him. He is in constant contact with the rest of his squad mates, and every single one of them has seen this thing upon returning home from Afghanistan. But they have also begun to notice they are being followed by someone. Black SUVs with blacked out windows always parked somewhere nearby. They know something. Part 3 it had been a rough time for Thomas and the gang after the events of the last story. Thomas had some of the most horrible nightmares. Most of them revolved around him being in the middle of the woods or some vast expanse of land, 
It would be nighttime and he would be freezing cold. It was there he would encounter the thing and wake up terrified. The strange thing was the similarity between the dreams Thomas would have and the dreams the rest of the squad would talk about. Each person had a unique dream, but the one factor shared amongst all these different dreams was the presence of the thing. One night, roughly three weeks after the first incident, was the second encounter with this entity. Thomas was on watch with another soldier, which he didn't mind too much since he hadn't been sleeping well anyways. Thomas and the other soldier talked a while about their dreams and how odd it was that they had never found any signs of the soldier that went missing. For the most of the night, it was quiet and Thomas just sat there smoking a cig looking out into the darkness and listening for any signs of movement. The night passed without a hitch until about 2 a.m. when Thomas heard the other soldier say, no way Thomas hadn't been paying attention and didn't notice that the other soldier had stopped scanning the horizon with the NV scope and instead was focused on one particular area. Thomas replied inquisitively, what? To which the other soldier just said, take a look. Thomas raised up his rifle to use his own scope and quickly was able to see what looked like a soldier on the side of the mountain across from where their base was located. Unable to make any more detail because of the distance Thomas went to get a sniper rifle that had a much better and much more powerful scope attached. He was making the return trip when he heard the other soldier start, whisper yelling his name, Thomas quickened his pace and made it back to the watch post. Thomas quickly set the rifle up on the sandbags and asked again, what is it? But his question was soon answered. When he focused the rifle on the area where he had seen the soldier, he saw it again, except this time the eyes that haunted his dreams were there peering back. Red eyes seeming to seep out from underneath this shell of a soldier. Thomas sat there watching this thing for what he said seemed like an eternity before it began to move. It did not travel up or down the mountain, but to the side. Thomas watched it all the way. But just before leaving eyesight and moving to the other side of the mountain, the thing turned, stared right at him and waved. Thomas shuddered and took his eyes off his scope. When he peered back through, the thing was gone. The rest of the night passed without incident and Thomas was put at ease. That is until they found the body of the missing soldier on the other side of the mountain the next day. No eyes, no bones, no organs, just a shell. A bunch of guys came running into the ranger station carrying their buddy with his pants partially pulled down or up and was bleeding because his buddies had dared him to sit on a barrel cactus and of course he had about 10-15 needles in his butt. We were 25 minutes to the nearest town and about two hours from the nearest hospital. The town had an rotating doctor at an urgent care center, but really equipped to handle something like this so we had to call in a medevac helicopter to pick him up. His buddies were freaking out. I thought this story might be of interest to some people. I promise this is all genuine. I've done my best to limit embellishments and tell everything factually. This did happen 10 years ago, so I'm a little fuzzy on some of the details but I've noted that where necessary. So when I was 15 way back in 26, my best friend Michelle, her parents James and Laura, and some family friends Janet and Trevor invited my friend Emma and I to spend a week with them at this place called Grindel's Hut. Grindel's Hut is a cottage in the middle of the Volcathuna Gammon Ranges National Park about seven hours drive from Adelaide, the capital city of South Australia. It's actually a cottage next to a tiny hut built by stockman John Grindel back in the early 1900s. More on him later. Her family had stayed there a few times and said it was absolutely stunning. One place they were really keen to revisit was Bunyip Chasm. The photos I've seen look amazing. Unusually colored rocks, ferns and waterfalls all around this narrow chasm deep in the bushland. Again, more on that later. That far north it's all dirt roads, we were driving a 4WD station wagon rugged car, but didn't have much clearance. While Janet and Trevor drove a Land Rover, which was far more ideal for the terrain. 
It was the middle of winter, so heavy rains had turned large sections of road into muddy slip and slides, and a few creeks along the way had flooded covering the roads. We managed to get as far as Igawarta, this brilliant Aboriginal cultural center or campsite run by the Idniamathanha people. The park ranger came through and said the road ahead was almost unpassable, and they had to close it for safety. So we decided to rent a couple of cabins at Igawarta and wait for the roads to dry up. I'm so glad we did because it was honestly one of the best experiences of my life. During the day we went on bush walks to cave painting sites, and at night there'd be a big bonfire where we'd sing songs and hear traditional stories. Some of it was a bit trying though, on the first night a bus full of Aboriginal foster kids rocked up. We were told by their teachers or carers that they were all problem children who had been in the foster system for a while, constantly being handed on by families who couldn't handle them. We did feel really sorry for them, They'd clearly had hard lives, but in all honesty, for the most part, they were horrid little shits. These kids were all 7, 12 years old, constantly screaming, fighting and using swear words I'd never consider using even now and they were not afraid of anyone. They completely vandalized the public areas of the campsite, trashed the games room and broke the latticing off of a rotunda. The camp staff were surprisingly cool about it, I expected them to go ballistic. They sat all the kids down and told them off obviously, but the kids just laughed. However, despite being little hooligans, they did still have an appreciation for country and Aboriginal culture. One of the stories were learnt around the campfire that first night was about an evil spirit man. He or it had a name, but I have no idea how to spell it. We all learnt about him in a fun little song written by one of the elders. The lyrics were about walking home at night and having the spirit man following you so you start running away or he'll curse you. Typing that out it's actually super creepy, but somehow the song was still fun and a bit silly. That first night none of us got much sleep because the kids were all up screaming and carrying on, but the next day they got taken out on a private bush walk with some of the elders, and they came far more solemn, I was taken aback. They told us that they'd learnt secret things they couldn't tell us white fellas, and all of a sudden, they didn't think the evil spirit man was so funny anymore. That night, they were all quite well behaved. A few tried staying up late and being silly, but the rest would shush them up saying the spirit man would come. They seemed genuinely afraid. The change in their behavior was so noticeable, I started to get a little worried myself. One of the Adnyamathana people's most important stories is about the rainbow serpent Akura, who is responsible for creating the land and animals. The story talks about how Akura came down from the ranges to drink all the water in Lake Frome before returning to rest in Bunyip Chasm. This was really interesting to us because Bunyip Chasm was on the top of our list of places to visit. Now, as most people would know, the Aboriginal people are deeply connected to their country, and there are often many sacred places that need to be respected or treated with care. For the Adnyamathanha people, Bunyip Chasm is one of the them, I'm ashamed to say I don't know the traditional name for the site. We ended up spending three days at Igawarta. When we left, we mentioned that we wanted to visit Bunyip Chasm, and the staff got a little funny about it. Again, it's a sacred site, and they take that seriously as we should have too. They advised us not to go there, but if we did to be careful. Honestly, the more I think about it, the more frustrated I am that we didn't listen. We're all very open-minded people. Michelle's parents border on being hippies, so we greatly respect Aboriginal culture, but obviously not enough to stop us going to one of their scared places. Anyway, on we travel to our original destination, Grindel's Hut. Now, Grindel's Hut is the most remote place I have ever been to in my life. There is nothing out there but endless bushland. I honestly can't describe it in a way that isn't wanky, but there is just something about such ancient, untouched Australian bushland that is deeply moving. It feels so empty, but also so incredibly full of life and energy. It can honestly be a little overwhelming if you open yourself up to it. I nearly had a panic attack when I spent too long thinking about how far away from anything we were. The only building nearby is the ranger station, we stopped in there to collect the key and register ourselves. You have to let them know where you're going or what you're doing, 
and when you'll return in case something happens and they have to come find you. Again we mentioned we planned to go to Bunyip Chasm. Apparently when Michelle's family had last been through it was fairly well advertised as a popular hiking trail or place of interest, but we saw almost nothing about it on our way up. The ranger said they decided to stop advertising it because there had been quite a few accidents. Obviously curious we asked her more about it. Just a few more background details here to help paint the picture. The chasm is a few kilometers up from Grindel's hut. To get there you drive your car to the end of a dirt track to a place called Loch Ness Well Spoopy. Then you have to walk about three hours up a gorge through the creek bed until you finally reach a dead end with only a narrow path through. This is the beginning of the chasm. I think you used to be able to just walk in, but now there was a big boulder blocking the entrance. Apparently this doesn't deter people and most of them manage to climb over the boulder and get in. So obviously when scrambling over rocks is involved there, going to be some injuries. First there were a few sprains, a cracked wrist here and there, then a broken leg that required the rangers to go in and carry the person out. I vaguely recall hearing about a death at some point, but I'm reluctant to say that's a fact. Because of all these injuries, they decided to try and make it safer by putting proper ladders in. Two tradies went in, and while they were drilling holes to install the ladder, one of them slipped and cracked his skull. That was when it was decided it wasn't worth the risk, and they stopped advertising it. The ladder was never installed. Michelle's parents are highly optimistic people, so they only found all this curious while my friends and I were quietly apprehensive. Echoing the staff at Igawarda, the ranger recommended that we not go there at all, but if we did to be careful. The main access to Grindel's hut is via a 4WD track around the gorge that surrounds it. But it hadn't been graded recently, and since the wagon didn't have enough clearance to make it through we left it at the ranger station, loaded all our supplies into the Land Rover and Janet and Trevor drove in while we made the 11 kilometer approximately trek through the gorge. Just even more evidence as to how extremely isolated this place is. We finally make it to the cottage when the rains come in again. After all the hiking, we were glad to just stay indoors and read for a day or two. So this was when we learnt the unsettling backstory of the location. So as I said, the cottage you stay in is built in front of the original hut, which is horribly dilapidated and super creepy, now built by cattle farmer John Grindel in 1918. Several mysterious incidences had occurred there. I can't remember the full story, but roughly John's cattle began disappearing. His mule was killed, then one of the men he hired to help him muster the cattle one year went missing and was found to be murdered. Grindel was convicted and jailed, but spared hanging. Apparently Grindel's ghost has been seen around the old hut, which having seen the hut, I do not doubt in the slightest. But aside from getting the creeps from the old hut, I never experienced anything personally. By the time the rain cleared up and we finally set out for the chasm, I was more creeped out by the hut than all the warnings we'd been given. The walk up the creek bed was beautiful. The rains meant it was flowing in most places, so we had to rock hop for a fair bit of it, which was fun. There were frogs, birds, and kangaroos about. Absolutely ideal hike. About halfway along, we came across another group. They were staying at the campsite back near the ranger's station and had driven in specifically to visit the chasm. Despite it not being heavily advertised, the chasm is still quite well known via word of mouth. We stopped and chatted to them for a bit, and they told us they didn't end up making it to the chasm because their youngest boy started feeling ill, and they decided to turn back. We wished them the best and carried on. After that, the hike started feeling different. It was probably a combination of the ever-growing cliffs looming over us and the warnings creeping back into my mind, but I no longer felt welcome. Now I know it's just a feeling, but being welcome to a place is very important in Aboriginal culture, otherwise you can upset the spirits who will play tricks on you or try to hurt you. We were almost at the end of the creek bed, about 500 meters away from the chasm when Trevor, the family friend, slipped on the rocks and twisted his back. It wasn't too bad he could continue on, but being an older man, and that far away from help, it was a bit of a worry. Trevor's injury slowed our pace a little, but we finally made it to the opening of the chasm. 
The opening was around two meters wide and exactly as the ranger described right in the middle was a large boulder about three and tall. It was much bigger than I expected and completely smooth, nothing really to grab onto. Making it even more inaccessible was the large dirty pond at the base of it. Despite the recent rain, it didn't look like fresh water. It had that dark brown color and had obviously been sitting stagnant for a while. Leaning across the pond against one side of the boulder was a decent sized log. Someone had clearly put it there to use as a kind of ramp to help climb over. Michelle's dad was the first to try. The log looked worn and was slightly damp from yesterday's rain. He slipped slightly and almost got to the top when it cracked and he fell into the pond. The pond is full of rocks so he got pretty badly bruised. The log crumbled down next to him. By this point I was certain we were not supposed to get into the chasm. The place basically had a do not enter sign on it. Something didn't want us there, but the adults were determined. We'd come this far. We looked all around for different options to help us in, more rocks, another log, but there was absolutely nothing. Finally Michelle's dad gave her mom a boost up onto the boulder. She's a tall lady and only just made it up. From on top of the boulder she sighed. Apparently there must have been a rock slide and the inside of the chasm had filled with rock debris, making it very difficult to get through. It was decided that even if we all managed to get over the boulder, it wasn't safe to continue on, especially with Trevor's back and Michelle's dad now bruised and soaking wet. I was slightly disappointed, but also quietly relieved. The mood had completely changed. Everyone was a little sullen, and with the sun beginning to set the gorge seemed gloomy and foreboding. Coupled with the unwelcome feeling, I think we were all ready to head back. Then not 300 meters from the chasm, Emma suddenly tripped and sprained her ankle. I couldn't believe it. We had been warned that there had been accidents, but we didn't even get into the chasm, and we had already had three ourselves. Emma is prone to the dramatic, so I thought she was hamming it up, but it turned out she was actually quite hurt and couldn't walk unsupported. The car was three hours away and it was getting late, so our only option was to take turns supporting her as we walked out. The walk back was grim. You know that feeling like someone is standing right behind you. It felt like that for the longest time. Michelle and I started singing to entertain ourselves mainly Disney songs because we're dorks, and that really seemed to change the mood. It was probably just a mentality thing, but the general feel of the gorge seemed to lift a little. Maybe whatever forces were around respond well to singing. I don't know. When we got back to the car, it was almost sunset and the wind had picked up. That was our last night at the cottage and probably also the creepiest. The wind didn't let up all night whistling around the cottage. Trevor almost had an asthma attack. He'd left his medication at home, but luckily I had an inhaler with me. He kept thanking me the rest of the trip. A potential attack in the middle of nowhere is pretty freaking scary, I guess. The next morning we packed up. Emma's ankle was still buggered, but since we had eaten most of the food we'd brought in, we managed to create a space for her in the Land Rover so she didn't have to walk out. Michelle, her parents, and I set off back through the gorge to the ranger station. After a week of hiking and exploring, we were pretty done so everyone was fairly quiet on the walk home. Michelle and I being younger and slightly fitter ended up a little way ahead of her parents. We had just reached the top of a small hill at one end of the gorge when something made one of the weirdest sounds I've ever heard. Now Australian animals make weird noises, cockatoos sound like bloody pterodactyls, but we're all outdoorsy nature people so we know most animal noises when we hear them. The closest sound I can match it to is a camel's bellow, but with a small shriek at the end. There are feral camels in Australia, but they're mainly up north. It could have been a feral goat, but we had goats at school and it didn't sound like that. It was quite loud and echoed down the gorge, so it stopped us in our tracks. We looked around for a sign of whatever had made the noise, but we saw nothing. We ran back to Michelle's parents, and they'd heard it too. They agreed it was weird and couldn't say what might have made it, but being as chilled as ever, they weren't really fussed about it. It was so odd, just one single cry like someone yelling and stay out, before slamming the door on you. That was an amazing trip. I learnt and experienced so much. 
but the biggest thing I took away from it was to always respect indigenous culture. I'm not at all religious and only vaguely spiritual, but I completely believe that the aboriginals are connected to the land on a level we will never understand. They know things, and if they say not to go somewhere, it's in your best interest to listen. I think someone died in one of the apartments next to my work. The last two weeks or so there's been this black figure. At first it was kind of hooded, but then I sensed it's a female, an older female. I started to see her clearer and she won't leave me alone. I've told her to go away, leave me alone. I can't help you, etc. I'm not that religious, but I prayed the standard prayer our father. It helped for a little while but not anymore. I can feel her trying to attach herself and I keep telling no. She's getting bolder and honestly, it freaks me out. I'm scared she might have followed me home, but my fiance and dog don't sense anything. What do I do? I can't smudge or anything since that stuff is unavailable and this is my workplace. No live candles or anything is allowed indoors. How can I get her to leave me alone? When I try to ignore her, she comes closer. My friend and I are still questioning our mental health after experiencing this. We were going for a walk when we passed by the large primary school and heard the sound of children crying, laughing and screaming like usual. We laughed it off until I, the first, heard one of the children say something to me, calling my name. I turned around to see the children still casually playing. No child was looking at me. My friend noticed I stopped walking because I was confused by what I heard. Then a few children began talking at once, saying something to us that only an ex-friend would say. About 20 or so children were talking at once and the same beat, and they were calling me a nasty person who had betrayed them something my ex-friend would say. It felt as if something was using their mouth to speak. I thought I was hallucinating, but my friend who was standing right next to me was hearing it too, as I looked next to me. She was as astounded as I was. For a few minutes it went on, something was berating us through their mouth. The teacher on yard duty seems to pay no attention to this event despite walking past them. I assume she thought the children were playing a prank. But were they? The other children who were not involved seemed to completely ignore it. I was scouting for road deer for the upcoming deer season. I know my area like the back of my hand, familiar with every buck, hind and sprung family group of road deer that lives in the area. I've been logging all the wildlife, plant varieties, and even weather conditions in my notebook for years. I knew a really big roebuck was probably using this one trail, so I decided to go out at dawn to see what would come along on the trail. I found a nice spot downwind of the trail, about 10 meters away. Looking at a big oak tree, it sort of blocked the trail and thereby forced any animals to walk around it and into my line of sight. I sat and waited, and waited, I saw a few hares, a hind with her young, loads of squirrels, and a pine marten. The morning dew came with some low fog. Nothing too bad, so I stayed put. Suddenly, it appeared fog came out of the big oak tree. In my country, we call it wit waven. Nothing weird, though. It happens when the morning or evening sun hits one part of the tree, warming it up while the other side stays cold. It's stuff for local legends about witches and stuff. So, back to what happened. I sat and wait, morning dew and fog came. Suddenly, fog came rapidly out of the big oak tree. I didn't know how, but suddenly there was a soldier. He stepped through the tree fog, or out of it, yelled something, and walked off into the distance. It scared the daylights out of me. I feared I might have ended up in a military training exercise, which was impossible since the nearest possible military site was 200 kilometers away. The soldier didn't look anything like my friends who were in the actual military. Just a steel helmet, greenish suit, 
belt, boots, and an old rifle. It confused me in a really scary way. It wasn't natural. I never told anyone, fearing people would make fun of me. However, two years later, I got confirmation it was a ghost. They found the remains of a WW2 soldier in that tree. He had probably been up there since the invasion in 1940. When I was in Groton CT for basic enlisted submarine school, I was roving the barracks at night. I had a UI under instruction, so I was showing him the ropes. What to check and, and how to check. It was mainly fire extinguishers and secured doors. Well, on the second or third floor of the barracks, there is a recreation room with a TV and chairs and a piano. Mind you, everyone was asleep, and it was two in the morning. Well, I decided to go and see if I remembered how to play the piano a little. We decided to continue to finish the patrol, so we started walking down the hall when we heard a single piano note go off. We both heard it while I was in mid-conversation, so we kind of looked back, and then we both looked at each other to see if we both had heard the same noise. We shrugged it off as our imaginations running wild. But as soon as we got to the end of the hall and opened the door to the stairway, a sharp keynote was heard coming from down the hall in the direction of the room with the piano. We left the floor as soon as possible and later shared the story with some shipmates, and they told us stories of sailors that had died in the barracks. This happened a few years ago, but it still bugs me to this day. I had just graduated high school, and as a broke soon-to-be college student, I needed some extra cash, so I took to selling all of my prom dresses on Craigslist. I received a call from someone who took interest in one of my dresses, so of course I answered the phone. Hello, I was calling about the blue dress you posted on Craigslist. I was a little surprised at the fact that it was a raspy man's voice saying this, but I didn't think much of it. I told him the size and the price, nothing crazy. He said that he and his mother were going on a cruise soon, and that they needed fancy cocktail attire for an event on the cruise, which isn't uncommon. So he was calling about the dress for his mother. Then he started asking questions, which at first I wasn't too concerned with, because if I were buying something that pricey, I would too. Here is a list of the questions he asked in order, and then my responses. Him. What size is the dress? Me. It's an eight, but fits more like a six. Him. How does it fit? Up top. Me. Um. Normally? I bought it my size, so I mean it fits me like it's supposed to. Him. What size bra do you wear? Me. I'm sorry, but that isn't relevant. At this point, I couldn't tell if he was genuinely still trying to figure out for his mother or not and just wasn't good at talking, or if he was just a major creep. I soon get my answer, though. Him. Well, I was just wondering. For my mom, you know. Me. Yeah, well, your mom should know what size dress she wears before she shops for them. Him. Is it a tight dress? Was it tight on you? Can I see pictures of you in it? Me. Can't even form a sentence before he continues on. Him. And what about panties? Would my mother be able to wear panties? Haha, -ha, if you even wear any with it. I would imagine you didn't. Your voice is so seductive and slutty. Are you a slut? Creepy laughter. At this point I was so appalled I couldn't even get words out of my mouth. Everything he said came so fast. I quickly told him he was disgusting and to never call me again. I deleted and blocked that number, and deleted my post about the dress and my Craigslist account in general. This is entirely too late to the party, but while I was in grad school, we needed a third roommate. We posted looking for one on Craigslist, and lo and behold we meet Craig. Craig seems like a nice enough guy, friendly, conversational, maybe a little weird, but affable enough. So Craig moves in, and we discover that he is on disability, 
I try not to pry as long as his checks clear for rent and utilities. Turns out, Craig has severe mental health issues. Now these issues themselves aren't actually a problem, as his medication does a good job. What the medication doesn't do well is mix with alcohol. Especially all the alcohol that Craig liked to drink. Within two months, he'd been kicked out of three of the bars in town's small college town for falling asleep or creepy behavior towards women plus just having very off-putting behavior at home also. We never formally put him on the lease, so we are talking about asking him to either cut that shit down or leave. Fast forward to January, record low temperatures, and the coldest night in about 30 years for the region. Craig decides he's going to go to the bar in the middle of a pseudo-blizzard. It was both the holiday break and about 20 degrees below zero so all the bars were closed he would make these decisions at 11 p.m. after I had gone to bed. Three days later we finally realized that Craig is missing kept a weird schedule, and I was just relieved to not have to deal with him, didn't want to look a gift horse in the mouth. Well Craig couldn't get into any of the bars in town they were closed and got disoriented in the snow on the way back. He was found the next morning with his eyes frozen open in someone's yard eventually losing all of his fingers and toes to frostbite, but lucky to be alive. My name is Alex, and I'm an experienced park ranger with years of service under my belt. I never could have imagined the terrifying ordeal that awaited me when I agreed to lead a team of scientists and archaeologists on an expedition to study an ancient Native American settlement in a remote, uncharted area of the National Park. As we delved deeper into the ruins, the atmosphere grew heavy with a palpable sense of history. The settlement was remarkably well preserved, a testament to the ingenuity of the people who had once called it home. But as we continued our exploration, we stumbled upon a horrifying scene the bodies of over 50 people, all brutally slaughtered. It soon became apparent that the settlement had been ravaged by a long dormant supernatural creature, a wendigo that killed people on sight. The mere mention of its name sent shivers down our spines, and we knew that we had to find a way to stop the creature before it could wreak further havoc. As we searched for answers, we found a series of runes etched into the walls of a hidden cave. The symbols told the story of the Wendigo, its origins, and most importantly, the method to banish it from this world. With no time to lose, we worked together to decipher the runes and perform the ritual needed to rid the world of the Wendigo. The air crackled with energy as we recited the ancient incantation and the Wendigo let out a blood-curdling scream that echoed throughout the settlement. As the creature writhed in agony, it finally vanished, banished from this realm by the power of the ancient magic. But as we stood among the ruins, our relief was tempered by the knowledge that we were too late to save the lives of those who had fallen victim to the Wendigo's wrath. The settlement, once a thriving community, now stood as a haunting testament to the dark forces that had brought about its demise. As we returned to the park, the weight of our discovery weighed heavily upon us. The ancient settlement and the tragic fate of its inhabitants would remain a somber reminder of the mysteries that lay hidden within the depths of the National Park, and the darkness that sometimes lurked just beneath the surface of our world. Nearly ten years ago now my husband, a mutual friend of ours, and I went hiking in the BRM in North Carolina. It was intended to be a day hike, lead by our friends so we brought only our day packs, enough water for five miles, and some of those tuna packs with crackers so we could snack. We get to the trail our friend had supposedly hiked before, and when it forked he said he wasn't sure which one he had taken but it circled Aroin, so either way it would lead right back. Now is a good time to explain this friend. He is spacey in the way that we have to remind him to eat the food on the fork he has been holding for a few minutes, or in the way he sliced the tip of his finger off with a bandsaw because he was looking at his coffee. He and my husband had been on many backpacking and hiking trips before, 
but our friend had never been a leader before. This was the trip he wanted to prove his skills. About seven miles in, on top of a clearing, he admits he is lost. When we ask a few of the random people setting up camp along the trail where the trail back to the parking lot is, nobody knows. So with no more food, no more water, and dwindling light, we are lost. My husband is excellent at orienteering, so he now takes lead. I am center, and our friend is the caboose. My husband gets out his water filter, filters water into our Nalgenes from a fast-moving river, and picks a direction to follow. About three miles into this new trek, it is now pitch black. We are in the thick of the forest. It is cold, and we hear a whimpering, whining sound. We stopped and listened for it. And as we do, my husband turns his headlamp back to look at me and freezes. His eyes grow large and he tells us to keep moving. And if we see a good, sturdy, walking stick-sized branch, to grab it without stopping. Of course, our friends and I looked behind us. It was a pack of coyotes. We had wandered into their territory and they were telling us to get out of it. We kept moving and the coyotes kept following constantly making these yippy whining sounds to let us know they were still there. It felt like a death walk, and the longest death walk at that. Finally, after what felt like dozens of miles, the trail widened and connected to another trail. But we followed my husband straight on the path we were on, as did the coyotes. The trail opened up to the parking lot, where we quickly walked to our car and quickly jumped in. As we drove away, we saw the coyotes standing in the tree line watching us. Our friend has never lead another trek since then. This is a story that my grandfather had told me back from when he was younger. He's had property in his generation for a long time, and he and his father used to hunt on their property out in Texas. As of currently, our family had moved to Minnesota, and then, as where we've been currently residing for a long time, we actually don't even visit the old property anymore and haven't in ages. My grandfather has been hunting since he was just a boy, so he's a fairly experienced woodsman who doesn't really ever fear much. It still gives me chills to this day to hear this encounter because my grandfather still gets shaken up every time he recounts it. My grandfather hunted all sorts of game, deer, coyotes, squirrels, you name it. They had a lot of property to work with, so he had a lot of time on his hands to really learn the woods around him and get a good feel for the game in the area. There's even wild turkey that would run around there from time to time, so there was plenty to hunt all season long. This particular day ended with him taking a route that he didn't normally take to venture out to a different part of the property that he wasn't used to. He and his father had several different routes they would take on their property to go venture off to different spots to go hunt. After making it maybe a mile is when he started to hear strange vocalizations and other bizarre noises in the woods around him. At first, he told me he thought it was a bird, but he said there's no birds in the woods that sound like these noises did. They would come and go, so he kind of wrote them off at first, but they started getting louder and more frequent. But he kept venturing further because my grandfather isn't afraid of anything. After venturing maybe another mile was when he started to get hit with a very strong skunk, musk odor that was said to smell like rotting meat and skunk. My grandfather described it like coming upon a pile of a hundred dead rotting skunks just sitting in the sun and baking. He said it was so strong there'd be times it was hard not to want to gag and vomit. He said he kept looking around but didn't see anything, but he started to get the overwhelming feeling that he was being watched. At this point, he knew something was up. He couldn't find the source of the smell, and things were getting more eerie as time went on. He also told me that as he ventured around the area, there were times where he would run into stuff that didn't quite look right, like markers that weren't quite man-made, as if they might have markings from animals or something. He told me about how he found smaller trees that were ripped up out of the ground and turned upside down and pulled back into the ground. What's scary was this is back in the 1940s, and their property was pretty large as well as being private 
so nobody was going to be hanging out on their property doing anything like this. And if so, who's going to rip up all these small trees out of the ground, and who's going to have enough strength to drive them back into the ground? This was really unsettling. My grandfather also believes he stumbled upon a small den of whatever it was he was smelling. He said he also found a small cave opening that opened up into a cave that he estimated to be roughly 30 square feet. But the stench of the dead skunk smell was where it was coming from. He also said he could see bones just from the cave, and it's alone and decided it was probably a good idea to head back home. Although they were the bones of deer, from what he gathered, he didn't want to take any chances. He told me that as he was leaving the den, he started to get an extremely overwhelming feeling of dread and felt the need to get the hell out of there. That's when he noticed rocks starting to be thrown in his direction. And I'm not talking about little pebbles. I'm talking rocks the size of a tire, literally being thrown through the woods about 10 to 20 feet near him. This was obviously enough, so he was so scared he booked it out of there and got back home as fast as he could. He said whatever was throwing those rocks at him had to be incredibly strong and obviously not a human. He said there were some sort of stomping and screaming noises that were going on as soon as he was leaving the den. Something was trying to drive him out of the area, and whatever it was was close by. He tells me there were multiple of these things not even 50 feet away, but he couldn't see them. After that, he still continued to hunt on his property, but not nearly as much as he used to, and he never went beyond where he went before. He continued to stay in new areas. His father never said much about it, and I guess there was never really a whole lot to discuss since back then, especially. You'd be practically crazy if he ever brought it up. The property ended up getting passed down to him once his father died, and not long after that, he moved to Minnesota due to his career. I had been out fishing once in the Norwegian mountains, a small lake full of fringpan-sized trout, etc., and during the summer night, this far north, it can be easy to lose track of time. I realized around 22 that it was getting dark, and I start packing up and walking the two hours back to my car. This is in the western mountains of Norway. It's pretty steep, and it goes from bare mountain to birch brush, then grazing meadows, a swampy bog, and finally spruce forest. I usually let my mind wander as I walk, there's nothing to be on the lookout for. The most dangerous thing in Norway is the government, and they sure as hell keep to the capital. I'm enjoying the walk satisfied with a day of fishing. It's warm, a slight breeze has picked up, and it's keeping the insects from biting. I'm in no hurry. My peaceful bliss was shattered just around midnight, when a shriek pierces the calm bubble my head was in. I nearly pissed myself. It sounds like a freaking banshee, and my blood starts boiling. Hairs all over my body is rising. I start to sweat. I knew the sound was from a fox, but for the remaining 20 minutes of my hike, I couldn't shake it. I started thinking that it sounded like a man being beaten to death. All kinds of panicked thoughts raced through my head about demons, horror movie monster, corpses. I have heard foxes shriek before, but this caught me by surprise. This took place back in the early 90s. My buddy would work until 9 to 10 p.m. On a Friday, get home, pack his fly fishing gear and essentials, and then rack for four or five hours. He would then drive an hour to my place and we'd load all the camping gear into his truck and take off before first light. This particular trip took three hours to get to the Cinema Henning Creek in Potter County, Pennsylvania. We got there early, set up camp, grabbed a brew and sandwich, and finished until dark. We turned in early because of the long day. I woke and could see moonlight peek through the hemlock canopy as I tried to decide how badly I had to go to relieve myself. I decided to get up when I heard something very heavy approaching the tent. I thought, great, a freaking bear. It came within four or five feet of the tent, and I could see a partial shadow silhouette against the tent. 
Its breath was a deep, guttural grunt, and it just stood there for almost a minute. I almost crapped myself thinking it was going to attack the tent, so I quietly unzipped the sleeping bag while trying to will the boogeyman away. As if by magic it left heavy footfalls trailing off into the night. I decided I didn't have to go after all and started to drift off to sleep when I realized it walked away on two legs. I instantly knew what it was and lay awake processing everything. I finally fell back to sleep after convincing myself it wouldn't return. In the morning I was careful not to mention anything to my buddy as I inspected the campsite for footprints. Nothing. Zip. Nada. The hard-packed earth and surrounding stones prevented any footprints. The weird thing is I kind of blocked out this event for years before acknowledging it to my buddy after he saw a Bigfoot in Lycoming County. Why I buried that event in my memory beats the hell out of me. For fear of ridicule? I don't know, but I can't help but wonder how many other folks have done the same. I was driving Thursday night at 10 p.m. September 7, 2023 on my way to pick up food in the Glenview area. Prior to picking up my food, I had a super uneasy feeling. I felt very brain foggy and just out of it. I really wasn't focused. I want to think it's stress because of working a 9-5. So, as I was driving on W, Lake Avenue, I was listening to music and singing along to my favorite playlist. I wasn't really thinking much. I drove by the cemetery earlier on River Road, which I hate driving by. I started, obviously, feeling pretty spooked, like out of nowhere. I don't know why I was psyching myself out, but I continued to not pay mind to that feeling and kept singing along to my music. It was Lady Gaga, so I definitely was singing my heart out. So I kept driving. As I drove by the forest on W. Lake Avenue, I quickly saw a strange creature standing still on the right-hand side of the road. I wanted to believe it was a deer, but this thing I saw was six, seven feet tall, standing upright. Deer don't do that. It had a dark gray cement-like colored body, and its eyes gave out the same red as bicycle reflectors do. That's what made me look. When I quickly locked eyes with it, my stomach dropped, and I got so scared. The same feeling you get when riding a roller coaster. I freaked out for a bit and I was thinking, keep driving. Don't look back. Don't look back. I quickly sped up to the upcoming white and intersection. I wanted to be around other cars in the intersection and more into businesses and buildings. I kept telling myself, nope. That was a deer. That was a deer. You didn't see us. I picked up my banchan chicken and drove on the highway back home instead. I forgot about it and went to work the next day. I kept thinking about it, so I told my co-worker what happened and what I saw. She's into paranormal and conspiracies and told me of the Mothman scene all over Chicago, especially around the O'Hare Airport area. So, throughout my research, I saw the Google Maps sighting site and had to reach out. Again, I never thought I would be doing this. But, hey, here I am. Whatever these things are, I hope they're nice. I live in Vermont and the experiences I had are in a small border town called Vernon in the southeast corner. New Hampshire to the east and Massachusetts to the south. I was taking my 13-year-old nephew hunting. It was his first or second time sitting in a blind alone. I believe the year was 2013. Anyway, his blind was roughly 200 yards from mine. It was early and very dark and somewhere around 5 a.m. The first light was roughly an hour away. We're walking on a snowmobile trail. My nephew's blind was on our left and up the side of the mountain, about 75 to 100 yards. He left the trail and headed up to his spot. I continued down the trail for a couple hundred yards. My blind was similarly located on the left and up the steep mountainside. As I turned and left the clear trail, I heard a very loud and long howl that was not like anything I'd ever heard. I froze in my tracks and listened in complete shock and awe. I felt no fear or even concern. 
The howl scream lasted for roughly 10 seconds. It wound up in a crescendo to a high pitch, and then a long, slow wind down and ended with an incredibly low guttural double grunt. The lung capacity and vocal ability blew my mind. Nevertheless, I continued to my blind. Once there, I moved a few sticks and twigs and settled in. The howl was on a loop in my mind, and I was trying to rationalize what I had heard. The topography was like a giant bowl below me. Roughly 800 to 1,000 yards through the trees were some pasture fields and a gravel pit. Beyond those fields were fields, farms, and houses. Then the Connecticut River and New Hampshire behind and another mountain. Any loud noise like a truck exhaust, brake, or car horn could be easily heard, even coming from New Hampshire. I was rationalizing the sound as coming from a bull. As a crow flies, the closest pasture was maybe 800 yards straight down the snowmobile trail, and that was roughly where the sound seemed to come from. Roughly 10 minutes had passed, and it happened again. It sounded to me like a perfect duplicate. It gave me goosebumps. We stayed most of the day. My nephew had called me on his walkie after the second yell. He was freaked out a bit. I told him not to worry about it that I was between him and whatever it was. We decided to keep hunting, and though we never saw it, a deer, or anything else, we stayed put until lunch. Fast forward about four years. My father, brother-in-law, and I purchased a 30-acre parcel of land half a mile as the crow flies from where I was hunting that day. That summer I bought a portable sawmill and set it up on it on the new land. I've cut trees and milled the lumber day in and day out. My dog was always with me and loved roaming around or just hanging out. One day I'd been sawing up some hemlock boards and noticed the dog was not around. I shut the mill down and started calling to him. I found him hiding under my truck. That surprised me. He had never been afraid before, but from that day on he would never leave the cab of my truck unless I forced him, which I seldom did. Something had scared him. I do not know what. That same summer I camped up there with a buddy Scott. I was asleep in my tent and was awoken by deep breathing and some low grunting noises. My back was against the side of the tent as I lay there listening. Whatever was outside the tent began rubbing against my back. I was sleeping on a double air mattress so my back was a little over two feet from the ground. My buddy had a young pit bull named Jersey with him, and I thought that she was the culprit. Scott's tent was twenty feet from mine and by chance, he had gotten up to relieve himself. He unzipped the flap so I said something to the effect of, Hey, Jersey is out here rubbing against my back. Scott replied that Jersey was in his tent and had not been out of it. At that point, I also got up and exited my tent. I never heard anything walk away. It was 4 a.m. and dark. I shot my flashlight around but saw nothing. I concluded that it must have been a black bear and went back to bed. Then there was the sound of wood hitting wood. It was loud like a shotgun. Scott heard it and we discussed it for a couple minutes, but neither exited our tents. I was awake now just laying in my tent when right at first light a rock was hurled from where the tree knock had occurred. I heard it clearly crashing through the trees and landing with a loud thud, followed by the sound of a rock rolling through the leaf litter. Judging by the sound of the crashing branches and the thud I guess the rock is soccer ball sized. At this point I rushed out of the tent and scanned the area, seeing nothing at all. I began yelling stupid or whatever was messing with us. I looked all around but was unable to locate the rock. Since that day, I had strange things happen for that entire summer. Every time I drove up the old dirt road, there would be a tree or multiple trees laying across the road. No stumps. The trees were not large, always completely dead, and lying directly across the road. It was obvious someone or something was deliberately dragging them there. My father had rocks thrown at him for 20 minutes while hanging posted signs around the perimeter. They were small golf ball sized and landed all at his feet or a few feet away. He saw a few of them flying in, like being lobbed underhand. He finally yelled at it thinking it was me playing a joke and it stopped. 
My father's 80 years old, I would not throw rocks at him. I'm not saying this was a Sasquatch. I've not seen one, nor do I want to see one. It would likely be a deal breaker for me. I go to my land with no fear. I want to keep it that way. If I saw one, I think that would change my perspective, and I would not enjoy the land anymore. My brother-in-law spends more time on the land than me. I've told him my experiences, and he brushes them off. He's never told me he had any weird experiences, and I rarely bring it up. I sold my sawmill two years ago, and nothing strange has happened since. Make of that what you will. I was on an assignment while in Afghanistan with my six-man team with a guide. We started to enter the Korangal Valley a K, and nicknamed by the locals as the Valley of Death. It is located in the Dara Epech district of Kunar province. The valleys are among the deadliest places on earth. History shows countless men, groups, and militaries have entered, but never come out. Our guide refused to take us through, so we went ourselves. There are stories of giants, caves, demons, shapeshifters, etc. It still gives me goosebumps. I now fast forward, back home to the United States. My group of six decided in our spare time to work the Appalachian Trail starting in New Hampshire and ending in Georgia. All told it took us seven months total to complete, with weeks in between of work, as we did not complete it all at once. We were near the Shenandoah Valley area. We made camps, set up three tents, made a fire, and cooked dinner after dinner at about 19 hour or 7 p.m. Three of my men, call signs Voodoo, Panther, and Deuce sat in a circle and talked. Two others, Dingle and Reaper, did perimeter watch. The camp perimeter was not far away due to the steep terrain. I would guess both sides were about between 25 and 33 degree angles. None of us could see how far up it was. It was too thick with trees and undergrowth brush. It was dusk when we made camp. I went to rest in my tent as I had the next watch. I heard all three of my guys say what WTF just as I heard a loud thump on the ground and then another. Now all of us are expert marksmen and well trained to instantly assess any situation, draw our weapons, sight, and threat, and decide to engage within a fraction of a second. We trained for this. As I exited my tent unarmed, I was the only one not carrying a weapon other than my 7-inch serrated double-blade knife K-bar. As I stood up outside my tent, all three men, plus now the other two men, were standing with weapons drawn. Instantly, they started firing at this 10-foot-tall creature that was about 12 feet away. It was head to toe, a very reddish-brown color hairy creature. It had an ape-like face and large red glowing eyes looking right at us. The growling was such a volume it reverberated in my rib cage. It was like nothing like I had ever felt before. There was a horrible mix of skunky and sulfur odor. It made our eyes water. It then began running with long strides that no human could do. It was like a blur as it passed through the edge of the camp. Then it let out a loud woman-like shriek as it turned and went down that very steep ravine into the darkness of the night. All the while it snapped two trees off about eight feet off the ground while it descended into the ravine. After it was over, everyone rushed to the ravine edge, but it was gone. Now our guns don't miss especially at that close range. No freaking way. Here's the really bizarre part. At daylight, since no one slept after that, we were all locked and loaded waiting for another attack. We looked for blood tracks. There was no blood, only two large barefoot prints. About 50 rounds were emptied into this creature at short range. Again, we all just said no way, that's not possible. Down the ravine, about 25-30 feet, were the two snapped off trees which we guessed were between 4 or 5 inches in diameter. We broke camp and continued on the trail southward. We're about 12 kilometers and begin to believe that this thing was shadowing us from above. We couldn't see it, but we can certainly hear it. Maybe it was another one, who knows. We all discussed it at great length and surmised it was obviously some man-like creature. We never discussed it again. 
That night is etched in my mind along with that unique odor, nor will I ever forget the unique growl and shrill sound it made. On December 25, 2016, I went to bed between 9 p.m. 10 p.m. PST. I live in Laguna Hills, California. At approximately 3 a.m. PST in the morning, I was awoken by a commotion in my bedroom involving my wife and daughter. I didn't investigate the matter and tried to return to sleep. However, my young daughter and wife failed to return to the bedroom. I got up to find out what happened. I found my wife and daughter going to sleep in my daughter's bedroom. My wife briefly explained to me our small dog who originally went to sleep with me pooped on the far side of the bed. When my wife and daughter got into bed, my daughter got it on her leg. My wife cleaned my daughter and semi cleaned the sheet. We have a very small dog under five pounds, so we're not talking a lot of waste. Anyway, I went back to my bedroom and changed the sheets because I could still see a little of the dog waste. I then told my wife she could return to bed with me, but she was too tired to get back up so I let her be. Well, I am a light sleeper so it was hard for me to fall back asleep. I want to mention I wear a sleeping mask to bed at night and take magnesium before going to bed because both help me fall asleep faster and have more sound sleep. I have had sleeping problems my whole life. I turned on the TV and watched it for about one hour before becoming sleepy again. When I fell asleep I had a vivid dream that bothered me and I suddenly awoke. It was still dark outside and I was lying on my left side. I was thinking about the dream when all of a sudden I felt static electricity all around me. At that moment I knew they were coming. I started to roll over onto my back as the static electricity grew stronger, but I also began to feel paralysis in my body. It felt like I was moving in a giant jar of molasses. I was just able to begin to turn on my right side before I was unable to move any further. My right arm and hand were hanging off the bed. I then realized I could see through my night's sleeping mask. There was no color. Everything looked blackish gray and very fuzzy. It was like I was seeing the static electricity. I then saw a small brownish gray being no more than five feet tall materialize through my bedroom wall on my right side. It was then standing right through my nightstand and in front of the light fixture. I remember thinking how diminutive in size he was. He then grabbed my right hand which was hanging off the bed and squeezed it. I then heard a voice inside my head saying, Yes, we are real. While he was squeezing my hand I felt a sudden sense of euphoria, excitement, and elation. I then communicated back to him using my thoughts and I said, Hi, my name is. As soon as that the event was over. The being left through the bedroom wall and I remained paralyzed for a little while longer. The static electricity in the room started to dissipate too. I was in such a state of shock, I couldn't believe it. I sat up in bed not knowing what to do. I laid back down because then a deep comfort overtook me. I felt such a great sense of satisfaction because I now knew in my heart and mind that I was going crazy and that others I knew weren't going crazy too. I had been given peace of mind. I went back to sleep having another vivid dream which I still remember. I then awoke around 8.30 a.m. PST. My wife was still asleep, but she awoke a short time later and I told her everything. I was expecting her to tell me it was a dream, but she said the exact opposite. She believes our dog sensed something was going to happen and that's why it went potty in our bed. Our dog whom we've had for seven years has never done that. She also mentioned our dog was acting very strange the night before, and we thought she was getting sick or eating something bad. This ended up causing my wife and daughter to sleep in another room, which left me sleeping alone in the bedroom. The next night I had a vivid dream of awakening, laying on my left side and completely naked. Everything was fuzzy and my vision was somewhat blurry. My first thought was, oh my god, I can't believe this is happening in my house but then I noticed I wasn't lying on my bed. 
I then noticed a small alien whose skin appeared brownish gray like a grocery bag on my right side. I was lying on the very edge of a table. The alien had his left hand on my right shoulder and his right hand towards my feet. His head was turned towards my feet, and he was slightly bending over me at the same time. At this time I noticed a feeling of deep discomfort in my lower back and buttocks area. But I couldn't move or say anything. Right at this moment, the alien somehow knew I was aware, awake and turned his head towards me. We were looking eye to eye. Next thing I know, I'm awake in my bed and it's early morning and I can see blue sky out the window. I told a close friend who advised I should look for any strange marks on my body. I found two parallel marks on my left, so I took pictures of both my knees. The marks have faded since then. I don't believe I can no longer doubt everything that has happened to me, and that continues to happen to me. I am just happy knowing I don't have to torment myself every day wondering if I am insane or not. Okay, so five years ago I was at my cousin's house for Thanksgiving. And let me preface this by saying they live on a very big hill. Very small mountain in South Carolina. Me and my cousin were walking down the hill into the woods. It was close enough to the house for us to see it, and it was about 2 p.m. roughly because that's our normal time for Thanksgiving gatherings. So we were walking down the mountain and we stopped to do something. I do not remember what we were looking at, but it was completely silent, and then suddenly I heard a very, very loud gust of wind and extremely loud stomping like louder than a 500 pound man running through the forest. So I turned and saw about 80-ish feet away, a glimpse of a white, beige butter color furred thing on all fours. It sprints extremely loudly parallel to us and goes between some trees, and then it's dead silent again. The fur was long, like a long-haired dog's fur. It's hard to describe truthfully, but you can look up sheepdog for a good example. Anyways, I get scared and me and my cousin run up the mountain to the house. And I ask him if he saw it too and he said he did, but he didn't react much or act like it bothered him at all. Part of me suspects he thinks him making it up and he is just playing along. Their family commonly makes up or exaggerates stories. Anyways, later, about an hour later, we went to that spot again. And this part is a bit fuzzy because I can't remember what part is real memory and what is fake memories my brain just randomly developed and added in. But where we were standing earlier in the story, there was what appeared to be a print in a bare spot of the ground the leaves were moved. I don't fully remember what it looked like, but I remember thinking it was similar to a bear claw but different. I think it had six toes instead of five and a thumbish looking one. It was quite round too, I think, like a paw. Take that all with a grain of salt though. The print memory is fuzzy. What could this be? My initial thought is a polar bear with some disability, but they don't live here. Then I thought it could be an albino bear of my cousin's bear watch, and they would have seen it again. Plus it was dirty beige, white, not pure albino white. Plus the sound randomly starting and stopping is weird. I'm at a loss. I was sent to a wilderness treatment program in southern Utah about a year ago. At the time, I didn't believe in skinwalkers, windigos, or anything like that. Just to mess with a superstitious staff member, I would scream at the top of my lungs, if there are any skinwalkers out there, you can suck a fat turd out of my Iowa A. Hole. Fast forward to early yesterday morning, around 3, 4 a.m. I was out hunting on a family property taking aim at a big coyote and a pack of others. Suddenly, all the noises in the forest went completely silent, and the coyotes took off running. I grabbed my night vision binoculars and started looking around. I didn't see anything, but I smelled the worst rotting flesh smell ever. I closed the windows and blinds, laid down in my hunting shack, and kept my 911 close to me. I waited until 10 a.m., just lying there, then I opened the door and bolted a good half mile to my truck, started it up, and took off. 
Also, there have been reports of cattle in the area turning up ripped apart and dead. I never had any of these issues before I got sent away, and I'm thinking one of those creatures followed me back here. I'm wondering what I'm dealing with, if I can kill it or get rid of it, and what the best course of action is. I won't go hunting again until I'm sure that thing is gone. I'm located in western Iowa, in the middle part. Any help is appreciated. Thanks in advance. I was fly fishing about an hour from my apartment here in Montana. I was generally familiar with the area and had fished that stream a couple times before. It was starting to get to dusk as I was making my way around the final bend before the stream ducked under a makeshift bridge that served as an informal trailhead. It could maybe fit one or two cars on the shoulder of the dirt road. However, there was clearly no cars or trucks parked there. I got up onto the bank and started walking toward the bridge and saw there were some small huckleberry bushes off the edge of the bank. I started picking some of the berries. It had been only a minute or two when out of nowhere I heard what sounded like a sizeball tree fall over. It scared the shit out of me because it was a calm summer night. No wind, nothing. The sound seemed like it was not more than a couple 100 feet off. It got my blood going but the curious thing was how it was dead silent after the crash. I figured if it was a bear or larger animal like a moose, I'd hear something. Shuffling feet. Branches cracking in the distance, but I heard nothing. Now I can't say this was Bigfoot, obviously, but it was something out of the ordinary that seemed more than just happenstance. This happened in 2011. I was maybe 12, 13 years old, and was with my parents in Florida at a hotel, going to Disney soon for the first time. They wanted to get to Disney early, so we called a cab at around 6 or 7 a.m. since it was a decent drive. I remember being excited to just be in Florida since I live in New York. I watched out the window. The sun was up already, but the roads were very empty and quiet. We were traveling on a highway, with dividers and highway on the other side parallel to us, and past the other side was tons of open green fields and wilderness which I was looking at. Being from New York, Long Island, I never saw such lush, flat fields of green. All of a sudden, I noticed up ahead a tall, huge, dark figure at the edge of the road. It looked like he wanted to cross the highway, but he was stationary as we drove by. My first thought was, is that a billboard or something? Since they have big billboards for ads on the highway. I glanced at it and suddenly got a sharp, intense feeling in my gut, like someone had punched me. I did a double take and stared at it as we drove by. It looked human shaped, but like a huge dark mass with thick, almost black fur and a weird shaped head. And it was definitely alive and it wasn't human. I remember saying, mom, look at that big thing standing there, but she was busy looking at the map and ignored me. I was intrigued and it was at the back of my mind the entire vacation. When we got home, I started looking into it and learned about Bigfoot and other cryptids and became obsessed. I saw the skunk ape Bigfoot of Florida. It looked exactly like it. My parents don't believe me, but I know what I saw, and it gave me an intense physical reaction that something wasn't right. It was my instincts. I went up Echo Mountain with a girl I was dating once. It's a reasonably tough climb, but at the top, there are the ruins of this old hotel complex that burned down several times about a century ago. Old narrow gauge railway stuff, etc. Anyway, we get to the top and we're sitting on what's left of this concrete staircase, looking out over the city, and I hear a rustling in the bushes somewhere behind us. I turn around and it stops, so I shine my light on it. It's some guy, in a weird hunched over pose, looking at me. Maybe 150, 200 feet away. He just freezes in the beam of light for a second, then quietly sidesteps back behind a bush and disappears. I called out after him, but he must have gone back into his underground lair. 
Anyway, we decided we should head back down the mountain immediately. Still not sure if drugs or serial killer, but hey, we survived. Girl refused to go up Echo Mountain again now. About a year ago, I went camping with some friends. There were about six of us, and we went for a walk around sunset. I walked ahead of the group, about five to ten minutes, and then stopped in a clearing on a hill to wait for them to catch up. I was looking around at the sun going through the trees when I saw something staring at me, peeking its head out from a tree. It had red or yellow eyes, and its head looked like a log or stump. It stared at me, and I stared back at it for about 30 seconds before realizing I could see it ducking back out of view. My friends arrived at about the same time as I did, and when I looked at them and turned back, it was walking away. It was tall and thin, with skin that looked like bark, and long arms with hands that resembled sticks. It walked into the darkness. When I told them what I saw, they told me it was an owl and made fun of me for being scared of a bird. I haven't gone into the woods since. Should I be scared? It's been haunting me since, and I want to know what I saw. I don't know if this is the right place to ask for help, but I would appreciate it. When I was around 14 or 15, me and my friends were playing airsoft deep in the Alabama woods, having a good time. Later on, one of our friends, we can call him H, shot my brother with a BB gun that he wasn't supposed to have, and it definitely hurt him a butt. I, in anger, started running at him shooting my airsoft gun, and he bolted off. He was a very large guy and a bit older than us, and he was in a white shirt that part is important. We continued to play about 30 minutes or so, and he never came back so we started calling him and looking for him when we saw what we assumed was him about 30 or so yards in the distance, just a big white object. When we called him, or what we assumed was him it, or he bolted the opposite way. We decided to go back to the house to get my friend's dad to come make him quit running. When we got back to the house he was already there and had been for nearly an hour we were all so confused as to what we saw in the woods that day. A few years later we learned about the Alabama white thing and found it to be a huge coincidence, but I always wonder what if to this day. I'd like to preface by saying that I got home about an hour ago and this actually happened. I never have paranormal encounters and genuinely try to approach everything with a questioning mind. My partner and I like to hike at a local park late at night. It's a historic park in Pennsylvania about three, five hundred acres in size that spans over into the MD and DE borders. One of the trails allows you to cross through all three states. The entire park is mostly dense woods with a creek running through. Usually we park near an old church with a Revolutionary War cemetery that is famous for a grave known as the Ticking Tomb. I've been to every corner of this park, day or night. We usually hike a short loop that is roughly a half mile in length. We've walked this trail literally thousands of times and never once felt anything strange. But tonight was different. We made a spontaneous decision to go on a night hike and left the house at about 10.45 p.m. I decided to take the narrow dirt road to our usual parking spot, rather than driving a mile up the road to a paved access road like we normally do. About halfway down the ragged dirt and gravel road as we rounded a corner, an animal dashed across the road in the path of our headlights. I've never seen anything like this animal, and I've never seen an animal that size in this area that I couldn't immediately identify. Its size was somewhere between a dog and a human, and it moved so quickly it almost looked like it flew. A literal black blur with some hazy details and bright silver eyes. My partner also saw it. I'm generally a skeptic, so I just wrote it off, and we both just kind of explained it away. We made it to our parking spot and pretty much resolved not to talk about it and continue on as usual. Immediately when we got out onto the trail, 
We noticed the frogs and cicadas were extremely loud, louder than I've ever heard them at night around here. As we progressed down the trail, it felt like we had to talk over the cicadas. We sort of quietly yet frantically attempted at lightening the mood with conversation. Unbeknownst to me at the time, about a hundred meters down the trail my partner had begun to hear what he thought were extremely distant voices. I also noticed that the cicadas got progressively quieter the further we got down the trail. We made it about a quarter mile before a sudden, louder sound felt like it cut through the space between my ears. It was something like a glitching microphone or megaphone way off in the distance. My partner pointed out to me later that there was nothing for the echo to bounce off of in that area. The moment we heard that sound I stopped immediately and asked if he heard it, too. Not only had he heard it, but he was convincing himself that he was hallucinating the sounds the entire time until I finally acknowledged it. Without discussion, we both immediately turned around and started walking at a fast pace back to the car. I felt like it was a bad idea to run, but we had to leave right away. We hoofed it back to the car with the feeling that something was following us all the way to the entrance. When we finally got back into the car and started driving, the feeling of urgency didn't go away. We made it all the way down the main road to our first turn, and I felt a moment of complete confusion. As I slowed to the turn, my partner asked me, Do you not know where you are right now? Because neither do I. We have literally driven this road thousands of times. I made a split-second decision to turn right, which was thankfully the right choice. The next road went along the perimeter of the park in parallel with the trail we were hiking. There was tons of fog, which hadn't been there on our way in. We spent maybe 20 minutes at the park. Just as we made our way past the area that we had turned around, another animal darted across the road in front of our headlights. It looked exactly like the one we saw on our way and only closer and in more detail. It had silver eyes and what looked like ears or horns. It was still insanely fast and either a blur or a wraith. I don't know how else to describe it. I get this really weird feeling when I think about it or talk about it. The feeling started when I saw it run across the road the second time. I feel like it's because I acknowledge that, whatever that thing was, I couldn't explain it. I feel an almost burning sensation in my sinuses, my eyes water, and I get a strange tingling in the back of my skull. Like I said before, I'm usually a skeptic when it comes to this kind of stuff. But this experience has left me rattled. Thanks for listening, Horror Cowboys. See you tomorrow at the same time.